this is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes, and today I'm going to discuss my first impressions after playing Outlaws of Thunder Junction in the Early Access uh, streamer event, which happened yesterday at the time of recording this. So I was only able to do four drafts and some a little bit of sealed, so I certainly don't have the most experience. Um, this isn't going to try to cover anything in a comprehensive way. This is literally just going to be reporting on what I saw, focusing on overall play patterns as I've observed them so far, and some uncommons that really stood out to me that played particularly well or in some way exceeded expectations or something like that. So I mentioned that I drafted four times. I um, That was three trophies and one four three. The 4-3 was with blue-red, and the trophies were with each of the two pairs of Mar Mardu colors. So a trophy with red-white, uh, black-white, and red-black. So some things I noticed. Deserts weren't really easy to come by. A lot of my decks were interested in playing deserts, even if uh, the deserts were only half on color to get the damage and the crime trigger. So that meant that they don't go very late. Thinking back on it, I think this is very similar to uh, Kaldheim, where I think that I was often at points in the format taking snow dual lands, like second through fourth pick, which is earlier than common lands usually go. So if you're trying to take deserts, like if you're trying to have a lot of deserts rather than just like a few deserts, you're probably going to need to be prepared to fight for them. And that means that as far as like their role is in offering an abundance of fixing to the format goes, it's kind of minimized by the number of decks that take them, but don't take advantage of the fixing that they offer. So that means that the fixing in the set is a little bit less good than it looks or that you need to prioritize it really highly. So like if you're willing to take it really highly, then you can have a lot more fixing than there is in other sets. Like those cards are in the pack and you can take them highly on to get them ahead of other people. But that means that that's what you're prioritizing. So it felt to me like there could be a like base green splashing powerful cards desert focused deck that's basically taking deserts above things that aren't bombs and not really worrying about synergies and uh just like having good mana and strong cards but nothing none of my drafts tempted me to draft that way which is saying something because i'm someone who very frequently drafts decks like that the reason for that, I think, is that the set feels very linear. Uh, like, the two-color pairs are mostly doing something in a pretty focused way, and the things generally feel well-supported and worth doing, such that when you're doing one of them, you just want cards that help you with that strategy, and a vast majority of the cards that help you with that strategy are in like the two colors that are set up to try to do that thing. So you just end up not really wanting to deviate. Also, like the cards feel pretty balanced. Ex I mean, with the exception of like a lot of the there are a lot of there, there are bombs, of course, but like the commons, basically it feels like how much you would want any given common is going to change a lot depending on how well it fits your deck strategy or archetype. And so you can get cards that are really important or strong in your archetype very late, provided you're doing a thing such that the like more narrow cards are really good for you. So doing a thing felt like something that was very like worth doing and easy, whereas drafting like five color soup felt very hard because I'd have to like give up a lot of picks for fixing. And because there were a lot of cards that were clearly good in specific archetypes, 
a lot of those didn't seem like they would be good outside of the archetype. And so I felt like my power level would be lower because there would just be a bunch of cards that are like asking me to do something specific. And if I'm not doing that, then there's just like nothing I really want. My first impression basically is that this format is much less soupy than like MKM or Wilds of Eldraine or something like that. It, it felt very much like about having a plan and cards that like work towards some specific goal that your deck is trying to do and not just like, well, these are the cards in the set that I like most, so I'm going to take them in order that in the order that I see them. It's really easy to overlook the impact of gaining one life or taking one damage in the early game uh, or just at times. Just like one is not a big number. It doesn't really like register as a strategic concern when you like gain a life for playing a common tap land that gains a life or when you deal a damage for playing a common tap land that deals a damage. But over time, you kind of notice in the sets that have like the dismal backwater, the, the ETB tap gain a life cycle, that when you like prioritize those things and you play the multicolor decks, the like, you know, four point life cushion that you get over a game feels pretty significant. In the same way, in this set, the like two to four, one and five life, then any life gain card is big because it's such a huge percentage of like the l amount of wiggle room that you have. Um, and then the more life you start with, the less life gain matters. So, but, so like, you know, 17 to 20 is not a huge difference, but it's enough that I really seemed like I could feel it. Like anytime I like gained a couple of life from a lifelink creature, it, it felt better than it does in other sets. So that does, you know, help aggressive decks, which is also a reason for decks to be fewer colors, more aggressive, more focused, less soupy. So the, the lands definitely contribute to that. So that's kind of like my biggest, like big picture takeaways. So I mentioned I was going to talk about uncommons that impressed me. So I'm going to do this uh, by color, but also in my games, the first one that impressed me was Getaway Glamour. This is the white uncommon spree instant. Uh, so it's base cost white plus one to exile a non-token creature until end step, and then it comes back, uh, plus two to destroy a creature with the highest power. So if you have the biggest thing and your opponent has the second biggest thing, you can get yours out of the way for a second to kill theirs. But it's much better than that. In practice, if I spent four mana on this, which is the amount to play both modes, it was very, very easy for it to be a clean two for one. The first time I cast it, it was a clean three for one. And like the three for one situation is not very hard. Like you have to, if your opponent is using a removal spell on your creature that has a card's worth of ETB abilities, and then you blink that to dodge the removal spell, retrigger your thing and kill your opponent's thing, then that's a three for one. If you only either save one of your creatures or re-trigger a good um, ETB ability, then it's a two for one. And then also both like half modes where you either flicker a creature to save it or destroy a creature for two or three mana came up and like it was very good to be able to do that. I was always disappointed because I knew the card could do so much more if I waited. But, you know, sometimes there are times where you just have to kill a creature or have to save a creature, and the ability to do that's really valuable. So get Getaway Glamour felt great. Other white commons that were uh, pretty obviously good, Lassoed by the Law, the four-mana Oblivion Ring that makes him a mercenary, uh, was obviously great. It's just a removal spell and a guy, and there are a lot of ways to use the guy but it's, you know, something like the Brothers War four mana thing that like made a power stone and gained two life and exiled something. This card feels very similar to that. Prairie Dog is the uh, one in a white 2-2 two -two lifelink that if you don't play any spells on your turn, gets a plus one plus one counter at the end of your turn. And then you can spend four in a white to double that. Like I said, lifelink is really good in this set, like better than normal. And uh, like a 2-2 two -two 
that passively grows is just generally good. And then put encounters on a lifelink creature is particularly good. And your passive, your creature that passively grows, passively growing by doing the thing that your like blue white deck wants to do anyway. And then there are a lot of ways to pump it. And like prairie drug is just fantastic. And then shepherd of the clouds is a uh, five mana four, three, ETB, return a creature with uh, mana value three or less from your graveyard to your hand. If you have a mount, I think, so, some condition where it goes into play instead. That card uh, was very good. Um, just like a lot of value on a like solid, like, a, you know, like a four, three flyer for uh, five is like un- below, slightly below average, but like totally printable like limited common uh and then just like go up a full card on cast um in a format that has like some ways to blink it and stuff is uh, you know very good marauding sphinx in blue is three blue blue for a three five flying vigilance ward two whenever you commit a crime surveil two all of the words on this card matter a lot. Um, the ward two with five toughness made it appreciably annoying or difficult to kill. The three five is like quite big. It's pretty hard to like reasonably block or attack into. Uh, vigilance means that it's like clocking while defending you. Uh, crimes are pretty easy to have happen, so it surveils a lot. So this game, uh, I didn't play or this card. Rather, I didn't play with it, but it felt. Uh, pretty oppressive um, some of the times that I played against it. Metamorphic Blast, blue instant uh, with spree, plus one target creature becomes a zero one until end of turn, plus three uh, target player draws two cards. This card's like pretty obviously good in that it's like inspiration with upside, uh, but the upside like really played well. Making a creature an O one. one um, it's like not very difficult. Like that's just get in combat with anything and then that thing is dead more or less. Like it doesn't work if the thing has a bunch of plus one plus one counters on it or whatever. But um, this saved me from like a giant rare while also drawing two cards. So like the ability to be a three for one, the ability for your card draw spell to impact the battlefield in a pretty tempo positive way, the ability for your card draw to spell to be played as a cheap interactive spell. Um, those are all like very good kinds of versatility that uh, make the card just feel generally pretty good. Nimble Brigand, I didn't play with this one, but I played against it once or twice, is a two mana one three unblockable if you've committed a crime when it damages, when it deals combat damage to an opponent, draw a card. This felt like just a better gateway sneak. Um, gateway sneak is the one three that draws a card when it damages an opponent and is unblockable if you've played a gate. This is like easier to make unblockable and just like having like a lot of, the, you know, the, the crime deck is like a lot of your crimes are kill a creature and having a persistent way to draw cards while uh, killing creatures, like that, that's very good. Um, so th- that just seemed like a, a really strong card. Binding Negotiation. One in a black for uh, Coercion. You look at your opponent's hand, make them discard a card. Like, one and a black for that effect is kind of above rate. Like, we don't often get no restrictions on that for that cost. And then this also has the ability that instead you can put a face-up exiled card uh, that they control into their graveyard, which means that you can put something uh, plotted and already paid for into their graveyard. So this is like the problem with Thoughtseize is that you are trading down on mana, like you're spending something to get rid of something that they didn't have to spend mana on. That can be mitigated by messing up their curve. Like if you take the only thing that they could have spent two mana on, and then they do nothing on turn two instead of playing a card on turn two, then it was kind of mana positive. But if their hand doesn't have like that kind of the ability to punch that kind of hole in it, then you're down the mana that you invested in your discard spell. But with binding negotiation, you can go very mana positive by removing a card that they've already spent mana for. So it functions like a 
depending on how you look at it after the fact or a preemptive counterspell. But also you can just play it as like a thought seize. So it's not a good draw really late, but it has enough flexibility and upside that I think that this is a card that, you know, is generally good to play. And, uh, you know, the, the play pattern on it is interesting where, like, if you don't have anything else to do on turn two, you should probably play it and find out what's going on and take their best card. But it's, you know, if you have other stuff, you're happy to wait on it because you're giving them time to plot and let you, like, counter their turn, basically. So this is, like, discard spells are pretty easy to overlook, so I just wanted to call attention to this definitely being a playable discard spell. Blood Hustler uh, is one in a black for a 1-1. One, one. Whenever you commit a crime, put a plus one, plus one counter on it once per turn, as with most crime stuff. And then for three in a black, you can drain target player for one. So uh, it commits a crime on command. When you do that, you drain them for one. Gaining life, again, is a much bigger deal than it is in other formats. Also, dealing damage is, like, more important for the same reason. So, like, drain one is better in this format than it is, than it is in other formats. The fact that it targets, obviously, is way better in this format than other formats because other cards also care about committing a crime. And then this also grows both when you spend four mana to drain them and also when you do any of a number of other things that include just playing a desert. So this card, like, gets big fast and wins late games. Really just, like, good at every stage. Fantastic card. Hollow Marauder is a seven mana, uh, six and a black, four two flyer with affinity for creatures in your graveyard, but it's not worded that way, but it costs one less for each creature in your graveyard. When it enters the battlefield, target opponent discards a card, and then if they discarded a card that costs less than four, you draw a card. So this is a creature that commits a crime when it enters. Uh, a 4-3 flyer is very much worth a full card. Them discarding a card is worth a card. Then if they discard something cheap, or if their hand is empty, you draw a card. So you're getting like, a pr very often it's going to be a three for one. Worst case, it's going to be a two for one. And then it's also like a crime. So for seven mana, it's not that bad. And then, of course, it costs appreciably less than that most of the time you cast it. I will say when playing with it, it cost a little bit more than I wanted it to or than I imagined it would. Like, I guess green black is theoretically doing a graveyard thing and it might cost less like at a reasonable point in the game somewhat often in certain green black decks but you want to play this in like any black deck and it's not going to play like you know necrotic mass in a deck that's dedicated to like filling your graveyard where you're regularly casting it for like one to three mana i'm expecting to spend five or six for this but i'm expecting to be very happy doing that rakish crew Makes a mercenary, and then whenever an outlaw dies, you drain your opponent for one. Note, importantly, Rakish Crew doesn't target. Um, like, unlike Blood Hustler, which is drain target player for one, this is each opponent for one, so you don't commit a crime whenever an outlaw dies. But it's really easy to make a lot of mercenaries in this format, and draining your opponent when each of them dies... Again, with like draining being more significant in this set than other sets is super, super powerful. There are a number of other enchantments that kind of like pump out mercenaries. There's a red one that does it whenever you double spell. There's a red black one that does it whenever you commit a crime. Um, so if you get uh, and like Rakish Crew is an uncommon, right? So you could have two of them in play. And then if you have that going with any kind of like thing that is creating multiple mercenaries over time, you basically like your opponent has to go really big over the top of you or you're just going to drain them out. Speaking of, I mentioned there's a red enchantment that uh, makes mercenaries. This card played really well for me. This is Brimstone Roundup. One in a red enchantment. Whenever you cast your second spell, make a mercenary plots for two in a red. I had a dedicated two-spell blue-red deck where my drafting algorithm was basically to prioritize cheap cantrips, plot cards, especially plot cards that gave me more cards, and payoffs for playing two spells a turn. As expected, uh, the like 
discard a card, draw two cards, uh, plot variant, and the 3-2 uh, bottle the top card of your deck plot variant were both fantastic and made it really easy to double spell. And so this card was making probably not quite an average if one mercenary every turn, but there were times when I would trigger it on both my turn and my opponent's turn, and I triggered it a lot, and getting a bunch of mercenaries was very strong. Like, mercenaries are definitely quite meaningfully better than 1-1 one -one tokens without the tap ability. And then, outside of, like, it being great in a blue-red deck that was triggering it a lot, um, I played against a deck, a, a deck that played um, Brimstone Roundup and Rakish Crew, my opponent was not really using their spells in such a way as to maximize their Brimstone Roundup triggers. Like, they cast a Brimstone Roundup on turn two and then cast another on turn three when it would have been strictly better to plot it so that next turn they could have cast it and another spell and triggered both of them. And despite missing potentially a number of Brimstone Roundup triggers, it was still like powerful because getting extra mercenaries with rakish crew was so good so while i think brimstone roundup is going to be best in blue red decks and usually gonna end up there uh if you are in a like dedicated mercenary deck um it can be worth going out of your way to trigger brimstone roundup to get some more mercenaries Take for a Ride is the uncommon Threaten variant in this uh, set that has Flash if you've committed a crime. Casting Threaten at instant speed is really, really, really strong. Like, you get to take your opponent's creature to block their other attacker, so it's, like, very often going to just, like, kill your opponent's two best creatures. So if you have a good number of ways to commit crimes at instant speed, like uh, the one mana um, take a fall or whatever, uh, blue target creature gets minus one, minus O, or minus four, minus O if you have an outlaw draw card, or the red one, three reach that you can spend one and tap it to do a damage to target opponent. Uh, if you have cards like that, such that you expect to be able to play take a ride, uh, take four ride as an instant, it was very, very strong. Outcast Green Blade is two green for a one, two ETB search your library for a desert, put it in your hand. And then this has plus one, plus one for each desert you control. This feels like the uncommon that would make me want to try drafting like a multicolor desert deck. If you have a good number of deserts in your deck, this is like an overstatted three mana creature that mana fixes and provides card advantage and also potentially gives you extra value because deserts do other things like commit a crime or turn off a blocker and commit crime repeatedly or give you a land that taps for two mana and like pick up a thing to trigger another thing. So like it's just very, very, very strong and it's a piece of like good fixing that makes you want to prioritize other fixing. So I, I feel like the way that I would most want to get into multicolor green desert deck is by first picking or finding taking an early outcast green blade so miriam herd whisper is green white for a three two on your turn vehicles and mounts have hex proof and whenever a vehicle or mount you control attacks it gets a plus one plus one counter so three two for two great good aggressive creature then it also, like, protects your stuff on your turn. Not that big of a deal, but can make, like, you know, like, sometimes you have combat tricks that, like, only work when your opponent's attacking, and this just turns them off. And then, most importantly, like, there are a lot of mounts in green-white. This just, like, makes all of your creatures grow every turn without needing any kind of extra mana investment or anything. Um, this card is, like, really, really, really snowball-y. The the games where it came out early, it just, like, ended them super fast. This card's, like, a very, very strong reason to draft, like, aggressive green-white mounts, from what I could tell from playing on the other side of it. So, that's not, like, a comprehensive list of the best com uncommons. There are a bunch that, like, look really good to me that I haven't seen in play yet. Like, Krom, for example, would have been very good in my uh, blue-red deck, but I never saw it in play. 
Um, and also this is specifically looking for cards that, you know, stood out to me in terms of doing something like leaning toward, card, toward cards that exceeded expert expectations, right? Like the five mana, well, the black uncommon strive creature that kills something and makes a mercenary, um, is clearly very good. Um, but that just, you know, it is what it says on the tin. Which I don't, you know, arguably that's the same situation as lasted by the law. Point is, I didn't mention every great uncommon, but those those were the cards that uh, I thought were noteworthy. So, uh, to sum up overall conclusions: the format felt fast, life totals felt significant, and the format felt highly synergistic. Um, decks had very specific game plans in a way that meant that uh, card values would change appreciably depending on what your plan is. So like, this doesn't seem like a set where I'm going to be very interested in like, oh, I'm drafting red. Let's see what the highest ranked red common on 17 lambs is. I'm just going to take the red common that supports what my deck is trying to do. And uh, so overall, very, very, very low on the soupiness scale, very fluid card evaluations. Uh, Splashing seemed less good or harder to do. I'm sure I'll find ways to do it in times that I like to do it. Um, you know, I'm never going to just like only draft two color decks in a format. That's just not really how things usually play out. But there are a lot of two color decks that do things where I'm very interested in doing what they ask me to do and very interested in being two color to do it. So yeah, those are my first impressions. So going to turn it over to chat for any other questions about my experience or discussion of uh, their first impressions. And as always, before I do that, I want to thank the newest patron over at patreon.com slash drafting archetypes. So Rubens, thank you very much for the support. Really appreciate it. And of course, if anyone else is interested in supporting the podcast, uh, getting access to notes, coaching discounts, other perks, go to patreon.com slash drafting archetypes to check that out. All right, let's get to it. Is it more like Modern Horizons, where only certain decks want the lands, or more like Kaldheim, where all the decks are likely interested in them? I don't know that that distinction is super clear to me. Like, I think that there's some amount, like, I, I I don't really agree with the binary there, but I mean, I guess there are certainly decks that don't care about it a lot, right? Like the blue-red double spell deck is not interested in playing off-color deserts because it's very good at spending its mana, doesn't care that much about opponent opposing life total, like some, but not necessarily enough to want to play a tap land for it, and cares a lot about using all of its mana. Other decks that, like, aren't really interested in committing crimes might not care about it, but like, if you're trying to fix it all, um, or if you care about crimes at all, or if you care about deserts, then obviously you do want them. So it's like hard to know in the draft that you don't care about them. And there are a lot of specific cards that make you care about them a lot more. Like if there's something that, you know, really pays you for a crime, especially in a way where you want your mana available, like Karavek, the rare that lets you play a black card from your graveyard if you've committed, committed a crime. Having a tap land that triggers that so you have all the rest of your mana available to replay a card is like pretty significant. So some fluidity, some people want them a lot more than others, but for the most part, like people should be thinking about taking deserts reasonably highly. Uh, what color pair did I enjoy drafting most? On the first day, I'm going to like drafting everything. Um, I did think that like putting the like putting the combos together to do the blue red thing is pretty satisfying but i also think that that's true about a lot of the other archetypes right, my impression is that the high rarity cards are powerful enough to merit two plus splash one or two cards or should the deck switch to uh two colors if at all possible there are certainly bombs that are worth splashing but in general, the set felt like synergy driven enough that it felt like more often than not, I would not be looking to splash. Is my answer. For Glamour, did I need to seek out cards with good ETBs? Uh, or are there enough in the set that you'll likely end up with a few good ones? Um, so the one time when I had it, I had two of them very early. So I was actively prioritizing that. 
and that definitely made them better. Uh, as far as like, if you see it in pack three, how likely is it that you're already set up for it? I'm not really sure. Uh, not enough experience to know. Did I get to play with Arid Archway? Assuming that that is the uncommon, uh, um, like the guildless commons desert, the ETB tap to pick up a land taps for two colorless. Yes, it seemed like if your mana can support a colorless land, like bounce lands are really strong. Uh, surveilling when you pick up a desert is real. Some decks are not interested in two colorless. It, it felt like a card that, you know, is not just like, going to go in every deck, but is very good in some decks that use it well. With such a synergistic and focused format ahead of us, do you see yourself picking two color cards? Pick one more often. In my experience, I've pivoted a lot less and felt rewarded for uh, sticking with a first pick. Yeah, I mean, the uncommon payoffs, like there are a lot of very strong payoffs for being two color. And uh, given that like a lot of the one color cards feel like they have a strong preference for what their second color is. Um, it's not necessarily the case that like all of the one color cards are that much more flexible than the two color cards anyway. Uh, as far as like taking it more, I don't really know how to compare frequency of taking like there, there's not, there's no standard of comparison to say more or less than something else for how highly I take Chrome, right? Like the the four mana Chrome in this set has not been another, in another set, so I don't have a baseline for how I, I take that particular card. And every gold card is like a unique question. If the question is just like, if you compare this to some other set, how often do I start the draft with a gold card? I don't know. A lot of sets these days have like strong rewards for taking gold cards. Um, so difficult to compare, but I'm not like afraid to start with a gold card. Does the synergy overlap in Grixis and Mardu leave more hope for those three color decks or it, uh, does it really seem like things are going to be faster slash more streamlined? So when I say that the decks are very linear, I don't mean that they're very aggressive. There are aggressive linear decks, but also like the blue red two spell thing um, can be a very controlling deck. Uh, black white can be a very controlling deck. Uh, blue black crimes can be a very controlling deck. The point is, regardless of like whether you're like a fast deck or a slow deck, there's a lot of pressure on your life total early, so you want to like not fall behind and play on curve. And there are a lot of synergies for whatever you're trying to do in two colors. So I don't want to be giving the impression that this is like a very aggressive format where you have to play aggro when I say that I'm generally pushed to play uh, two colors. As far as like, do Mardu or Grixis make it seem more likely to me that I'll want to draft more than two colors sometimes? Yes, the fact that there are overlapping synergies among three color pairs does make it appealing to try to like take advantage of those, of those overlapping synergies at some point. Also, like I played against a deck that had both overwhelming forces, the eight mana uh, kill all of your opponent's creatures and draw a card for each of them, and cruel ultimatum. So like Grixis control, if you have the right rares, is certainly like a thing that can happen. So my conclusion that like things were less soupy and I felt like more pressure to do a a um, linear thing is not intended to be a statement about like format speed. Did I have any many games where I ran out of stuff to spend mana on? Um, I believe some of the Mardu decks were capable of running out of stuff to do. I think the blue red deck was very good at card flow. Like I, I was the blue red deck. I was more in danger of running out of cards in library than stuff to spend mana on. Seeing Gissa in action sure concerned me. At least she's mythic. Yeah, there are mythic cards that are powerful. Uh, Gissa is one of them. But I think that like the Paul Bunyan card, like Bonnie Paul or whatever, is probably better. Maybe not. They're both crazy. 
One thing I'll have to get used to is mercenaries and saddling is at sorcery speed. Yes, uh, I forgot that saddling was sorcery speed. Um, and in one of my games, I tried to like go to the beginning of combat because I had uh, the rare mount that put a plus one plus one counter on a creature and then try to saddle with that creature after it got the plus one plus one counter. And then I realized that I couldn't do that when Arena didn't let me. Um, so yeah, mount is sorcery speed. So uh, watch out for that. And mercenaries are sorcery speed, which like if they weren't sorcery speed, it would be impossible to ever engage in combat. So it's it's good that those are sorcery speed. How important is removal in the format? That's actually a really good question. That's something that I intended to talk about and forgot about. Removal felt very good. I had uh, like um, some like my black white deck was very removal heavy and the games that I lost were the games where I didn't draw my removal and having a lot of removal like generally felt good. I didn't feel like, oh, there are all these like mercenaries and there's nothing worth using a removal spell on. Might have just been, you know, luck with the opponents I played against or the structure of the rest of the deck. But certainly in the games that I played, I always felt like I wanted, like I had a good use for all the removal spells that I had. And um, there were definitely more times where I wanted a removal spell and didn't have one than that I like had a removal spell that was like rotting in my hand or too clunky to play or something like that. Huge grain of salt on this. We're on very small sample size and this is a pretty big like topic. But uh, my first impressions were certainly that this is a format where removal felt relatively like noticeably good um, as opposed to like clunky. I mentioned Brimstone Roundup is worthwhile even outside of Blue-Red. Two spells, if you're interested in mercenaries, outside of Blue-Red, do you think having a mass concentration of cheap spells or team-up plot cards with potentially expensive three to four mana cards uh, to trigger your enchantment? Yes. I think you're intending that as an either-or. Like, are you planning to use multiple cheap spells or are you planning to use plot to trigger this? And the answer is outside of like dedicated blue red two spells, it's a little bit harder. So you use all of the tools that are available and you'll sometimes trigger it in one of those ways and sometimes the other. Did I have any experience playing with or against the mill cards? It seems like they're a fair number. Do I think a mill deck could potentially be viable? I saw like Luis tweeted about playing a mill deck. Uh, I didn't play any games where mill was relevant outside of just like na naturally decking myself. All right. Um, uh, I believe caught up on questions. So I am going to wrap it up there. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, the questions, of course. Thanks for listening. I suspect that I will be able to, yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, on Wednesday at my normal time, th so this set is going to be available to play on Arena on Tuesday. So next week I will not have had a ton of additional experience. Um, I don't know. I don't think that I'm going to be playing a lot of uh, the format in paper this weekend. Um, so uh, it's still the format's still going to be pretty new to me next week. But I'm pretty sure that I will be able to find a color pair that I can uh, do a reasonable uh, breakdown of. So. Uh, next week is going to be, you know, starting the regular uh, arc one archetype at a time structure uh, that you should come to expect from this podcast, um, should have if you've been listening. And I'm excited to play the set. Um, definitely seems uh, pretty fun. And another third Thursday podcast, perhaps. I just like there are archetypes that I feel like I could reasonably talk about now. So I think that I will feel comfortable enough doing one at the usual Wednesday time next week. So I, I am going to plan for the regular Wednesday recording uh, next week and moving forward. So uh, that's all the business I have. Um, so thanks again. And I uh, will be back next week. Bye for now. Prepare for light speed.